I am Gopinath, advocate practicing High Court Pilsam. So, we're having a very enlightening and stormy session today. I must personally thank on behalf of all the audience, Dr. Zaki. Now, two small things filling my mind. One thing, why Islam prescribed non vegetarian diet? Another one, whether politicians can dab into religion, whether religion can independently survive without leading on politics. So whether there's two questions, the second question is with politics and Islam. Can religion survive without politics? Brother, as I said, Islam is a complete way of life. There is politics in Islam, but it's not similar to the modern politics that we have, you know. Everyone's filling the pockets, etc. So Islam is against such modern politics. But there is a political system in Islam. As I said, Islam is a complete code of conduct. It's a complete way of life. You cannot be a good Muslim without being a good worldly human being. You have to be. So even Islam speaks about politics, that's a different field, but surely what they refer to modern politics, Islam is far away from that. Islam doesn't encourage this politics. Where they scratch people's back and they try and fill their pockets, their pocket is more important than other people's betterment. Islam is against that. Regarding your first question, which is a very important question, especially since we're having dinner now, after the question and session, the brothers pose the question, why does Islam, why does Islam say that you should have non-veg? Why does Islam allow non-veg? That's a very good question. If you analyze, brother, the set of teeth of the herbivorous animals, the cow, the goat, the sheep, they have got flat set of teeth. They can only have vegetables. If you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animals, the lion, the leopard, the tiger, they have pointed set of teeth. They have only non-veg. If you analyze the set of teeth of the human being, we have got flat teeth as well as pointed teeth. We have carnivorous as well as herbivorous. We have an omnivorous set of teeth. If God Almighty, our Creator, wanted us to have only vegetables, we would have given only flat teeth. Why did He give us pointed teeth? There's a purpose. Even if you thrust down the throat of goat, sheep, cow, the herbivorous animal, non-veg, it will not digest. The digestive system cannot digest. Similarly, the digestive system of the carnivorous animal cannot digest vegetables. The digestive system of the human beings can digest both non-veg and veg. If God Almighty wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us the digestive system that can digest both? If you analyze, if you analyze the Hindu scriptures, if you read, they said the sages and sons, they had non-veg. It's mentioned there. Even if you read the Ramayana, so again I'm quoting, I always give the reference, people should not think I'm pulling a fast one. I'm not pulling a fast one because I give references. People, when I give information to Muslims, they get shocked at mentioning the Quran Hadith. When I mention about Rama and Vedas to non-Muslims, they get shocked. It is mentioned in Ayodhya Khandam, chapter number 90, chapter number 26, that when Ram was sent for Banwas, when he was sent for Banwas, he told to his mother, I will have to sacrifice my tasty meat dishes. That means Ram ate non-veg. He ate meat. The reason why the Hindu philosophy later on changed to vegetarian is a reason. There has to be a reason. Because people were being influenced by the ahimsa of the other ways of life, Buddhism, Jainism, etc., which believes in ahimsa. So to prevent people from converting to other religion, they accepted vegetarian. Now if you analyze when you ask these Jains and all, that why do you have only vegetables? They tell you that, see, plants are without life. Animals are with life. Therefore, killing any living creature is wrong. And I agree with it. If you have to kill any living creature without a cause, it is haram even in Islam. If you kill any living creature, let it be an ant also, without a cause, it is not allowed in Islam. But they have a misconception that plants don't have life. Today science has advanced and we have come to know that even plants have got life. So their reason has failed. So they have come out with a new answer saying that see the plants do have life, but they can't feel pain. The animals can feel pain. Therefore, killing an animal is a greater crime as compared to killing a plant. Today science has advanced and we have come to know the plants can feel pain. They can even cry. They even feel happy. You know? They have a nervous system but it will develop. There is research in America that a farmer had an equipment. That the cry of the plant can't be heard by human beings because the frequency of the human ear is from 20 cycles to 20,000 cycles per second. You know silent dog whistles? The dog can hear till 40,000 cycles per second. So when you blow the dog whistle, human beings can't hear but the dog comes to the master. 
So human beings can only hear from 20 cycles to 20,000 cycles per second. Maybe the cry with the plant gives, it is out of the range. So a farmer took out an equipment in which the moment the plant didn't get water, it cried and it could hear it. So plants can feel pain, they even feel happy, they can even cry. So there was a person who had the maximum argument with me and he said, see brother Zakir, I agree with you that plants are living creatures, they can feel pain. But you see, if you analyze logically, the animals, they have got five senses. The plant, they have got two or three senses. So killing a living creature with our, which has got five senses is a greater crime than killing a living creature which has got three senses. Logical. I say for sake of argument, I agree with you. Suppose your brother, he is born deaf and born dumb. And when he grows up, if a criminal comes and murders him, will you go and tell the judge, Oh my lord, give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less. Will you say that? You will say, give the murderer a bigger punishment. The poor person couldn't support himself. So in Islam it is, you can... In Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 168, eat of the good things they have provided. But a Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being of pure wage. He can be. Not that he can't be. Quran does not say you should have non wage You can be a good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. But if you analyze, there is no first class protein in, in vegetarian. Do you know that? The best protein of vegetables is soya bean, which is second class. The non veg have the first class protein, which is not then vegetables. There are articles coming written by scientists who say that these are the benefits of vegetarian over non veg. They are promoting vegetarian because it's their way of life. But there are articles written by non vegetarian scientists also which disprove that. So when you have a person who has knowledge of both non veg and veg, you'll come to know that eating non veg is beneficial for the human body. So when Allah has given us good food, which you can have, why should you abstain from it? Hope that answers the question. Would you stand up? Thank you. Question is this. Dear doctor, some people think that Muslims are taking non-vegetarian food, multi-celled animal flesh. As a result of this, they are not able to control their emotions and feelings. Is this correct? Please throw some light on this. The brother asked a very good question. <laughs> and the basis is, the diet that you have, it has an effect on your behavior. And I do agree with it. The diet that you eat, the food that you eat has an effect on your behavior. That's the reason Islam only allows us to have herbivorous animals like cow, goat, sheep, you know, mild people. We have to be mild. We are not allowed to have lion, tiger, leopard, carnivorous. If you eat those lion, tiger, leopard, you'll become like a lion, tiger, leopard. It's right. The food that you eat has an effect on your behavior. Science has said that. That's the reason we only have herbivorous animals, you know, like cow. A domicile, you know, cow, so humble. To, no? Gao, we say, you know, cow. So we are allowed to have that because we want to be humble. non veg of lion, tiger, leopard, a prophet said anything which is carnivorous animal, anything which has got claws and canine teeth, are not allowed to have that meat. The prophet said. And there were research in America that people were only fed on vegetarian for months together, and another group of people were only fed on non veg. So you cannot feed only on non veg. When you say non veg, it means vegetables included. When you say non-veg, it includes veg also. It includes veg. So those who were, sorry, who were fed on non-veg, their social behavior was much better than those who were only fed on vegetables. There's a research done. The documents are there. People have a misconception that if you have only vegetables, the difference is very minute. It's not major difference. It's a minute difference that the social behavior of the pure vegetarians is less social as compared to non-veg. Research says that. So if you analyze, but the people, some vegetarians are soft, some are ferocious, some non veg are soft, some are ferocious, that is because of the atmosphere, not the diet, it is because of the upbringing. Maybe the teachers who they got were ferocious and they told them to behave like that. Otherwise, Islam is a religion of peace. Come from the root word salam. We always promote peace. Always we promote peace. And it's a peace loving, merciful religion. Hope that answers the question. Here is a question from Mr. Ashut Ramayya, Executive 
leader. Would you stand up, sir? Thank you. The question is this. Why is polygamy allowed for men but not for women? There's one more question, sir. Why is there no birth control in Islam? Regarding the first question, that why is polygamy allowed for the male but not for the woman? Why is a man allowed to do polygyny? Polygyny means a man having more than one spouse, more than one wife. And polyandry is a woman having more than one husband. In fact, if you analyze, Quran is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. It's a shocking news. Quran is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. If you read the Ramayana, if you read the Vedas, if you read the uh, Bible, other scriptures, no scripture says marry one except the Holy Quran. In fact, if you read the scriptures of the Christians, they say Solomon had hundreds of wives. Abraham had more than one wife. The Bible says three wives. Even the Hindu scriptures had several wives. The father of Ram, King Dashrath, he had more than one wife. Holy Quran is the religious scripture which says marry only one. It says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 3 that marry women of a choice in two, threes or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. Islam put an upper limit. In the other ways of life you can marry as many as you want. No, no, no upper limit. Islam put upper limit maximum four. But you can only marry if you can do justice. If you can't do justice, marry only one. And the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 129 that it is difficult to do justice between your wives. So don't altogether turn away from them. It, nowhere it's mentioned in Islam that if you marry more than one wife, you'll get more blessings. Nowhere it's mentioned. It's optional. Now why is Islam given permission for a man to marry more than one wife? The reason is that Islam has given permission is because if you analyze the birth rate of male and female, they're approximately equal. But if you ask any pediatrician, a doctor of the children, he will tell you that the female child can fight the germs and disease much better than the male child. They are the stronger sex medically. So there are more death rates in the male children than the female children. When you grow up, there are accidents taking place, wars take place, more men die than women. If you analyze the statistics of the world, India is one of the few countries in which the male population is more than female. You know why? Because the answer given in BBC in the television program, Let Her Die by the title Assignment. Emily Beckenin, a Britisher, she came and said, according to the statistics, every day more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted after they identified that they're female. According to the government hospital report of Tamil Nadu, out of 10 born alive, 4 are put to death, female children. Islam prohibits female infanticide. In Surah Taqweer, chapter 81, verse number 8 and 9. In fact, Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 31, as well as in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 151, kill not your children for want of sustenance. For it is Allah that will give sustenance to you and your children. So killing of children is prohibited in Islam, whether it's male or female. So it's because of this reason that the male population is more in India. If you stop this evil practice of female infanticide and female fetishide, even in India, within a few decades, the females will be more. If you know the statistics of America, in America alone there are 7.8 million females more than male. In New York alone there are 1 million females more than male. Out of the population of New York, one third are gays. Gays means for the might, for my loot, who can't find female partners. There are more than 25 million gays in America. So if you take the statistics, there are more than 30 million females in America who can't find husbands. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than male. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than male. In Russia alone, there are 7 million females more than male. And Almighty God alone knows how many million females are more in the world than the male. If I agree with the custom, the religious scriptures put no upper limit. You can marry as many as you want. If you believe with the custom of the other ways of life, that you should marry only one. And suppose my sister happens to live in America. And suppose the market is saturated. Every man has got a wife for himself. Yet there will be 30 million females who will not find husband. And if my sister happens to be one of those unfortunate ladies who has not got married, living in America, the only option remaining for her is that she either marries a man who already has a wife or become public property. There is no third option. And I've asked this question to modest people. What would you prefer for your sister that 
would you prefer the sister marrying a man who already has a wife, or would you prefer being a public property? All the modest people say, we choose the first. When required. Otherwise, if we can find a person who has no wife, grab him. No problem. Regarding the second part of the question, that why aren't Muslim women allowed to marry more than one husband? The reason is that if you analyze, if a man has more than one wife, you can identify the father as well as the mother. But if a woman has more than one husband, you can identify the mother but not the father. There are today researchers saying that you can have genetic coding and the blood testing which can identify, may be possible. It's been accepted in the court of law. I've got no objection. That's one of the reasons, maybe for the past. There are other reasons that a man is more sexual than the woman biologically. And if a man has more than one partner, more than one wife, there are no problems of sexual disease. But if a woman has more than one husband, there are chances of venereal disease. Today, science tells us. More chances of AIDS, more chances of venereal disease. So that is the reason Islam does not allow polyamory. Hope that answers the question. Birth control, again, the answers are very wrong. Birth control means, birth control is the word used, but everyone should follow this hook or back rope. Like, for example, India takes out the law, hum do hamare do. Ek ke baad abhi nahi, do ke baad kabhi nahi. The irrespective whether you're rich or poor, if my parents would have done family planning, I would not be here. I'm the fifth child of my parents. I would not be there in front of you. So birth control is not allowed in Islam. Birth control means everyone, whether you're rich or poor, anything you follow. Regarding family planning, there are do's and don'ts. You can refer to my video cassette, Quran Modern Science. It's given there. You can refer to that video cassette. It's a long answer. Hope that answers the question. He writes, Sir, you spoke about universal brotherhood, but if a non-Muslim boy is going to marry a Muslim girl, I think no one will tolerate it. Where does universal brotherhood go then? It's a very good question posed by the brother, that no one will agree with a non-Muslim person marrying a Muslim. Where does the universal brotherhood go? It's like you asking me, that we will make a car and one will put a cycle tire, one of the tires is a cycle tire and the other is a truck tire. How will the car run? How will the car run? See, the way of life should be the same. A wife is your life partner. In Islam, the Quran says marriage is a mithaq. It's a sacred covenant. Sacred covenant. It is not that she becomes your slave or... It's a sacred covenant. Both have equal rights. Both have rights unto one another. If the way of life is different, if the way of life is different, one person says, I'll go to the church on this day, one person will go to the mosque, and they start worshipping different things, etc. It will not be a good vehicle. The vehicle cannot run. So for harmony, for the family to run good, both should have the same philosophy. It's very important. If they have different philosophies, it will surely not run. Therefore, I said, Islam believes in universal brotherhood. All the human beings are my brothers. But the Muslims are brother in faith. The brother in faith. See, you have different human beings. You may have different Christians also. If that Christian doesn't agree with your view, you will even not marry that Christian. A Christian who doesn't agree with your Christian philosophy, you will not marry that Christian also. Because the philosophy of both the life partners should be same, then it will be a very smooth sailing. If the philosophies differ, it will be like a cycle tire and a truck tire, the vehicle will not go. That's the reason the philosophy and way of life of both the life partners should be same. Hope that answers the question. Another question here. The question is, Mr. Suraj, would Mr. Suraj stand up, please, sir? Thank you, Mr. Suraj. You haven't said what business or occupation you do, sir. Anyway, why is it that non-Muslims are looked down upon and known as kafir? The word kafir is used in a different manner which criticizes the other religions. The question poses <clears throat> that why do you call non-Muslims as kafir and why do you look, the, look down upon them? Whether the Arabic word kafir comes from the root word kuf means means to deny, <coughs> to conceal. 
in context of the Quran, it means one who denies the truth of Islam. So anyone who is a non-Muslim, Arabic word kafir is another word for non-Muslim. So if you are non-Muslim, I have to call you non-Muslim. The Arabic word for non-Muslim is kafir. If you feel that calling kafir is abusive, it's wrong, then you become a Muslim. <laughs> See, if someone tells me I am a non-Hindu, if someone tells me I am non-Hindu, why should I feel bad? I mean, if someone tells me non-Hindu, I mean, it's not abuse to me. So if someone calls you a non-Muslim, and if you're not a non-Muslim, he's speaking the truth. That you don't accept Islam. So you're a kafir, means you're rejecting. It's a word for non-Muslim. If you feel that suppose someone robs, and if he says, why are you calling me a robber, then you should stop robbing. So if he says that feeling, saying kafir, you're feeling bad, then accept Islam, you won't call you kafir. So it is a word, an Arabic word, used for people who are non-Muslim. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Islam preach peace. Why are there so many violent incidents associated with Muslims? For example, fundamentalist terrorists. Islam preach equality of gender. Why is it that women of Islam are not allowed to have equal rights of employment in Afghanistan? Well, I suppose the question that Islam believes in peace or universal religion, why you find they're called as terrorists, as fundamentalists, Women aren't given the equal rights, etc. Brother, I can refer to my video class that women's rights in Islam, modernizing out it. This is a lecture to us. This is a question and session for two hours. Women's rights in Islam, modernizing out it. And I proved there that in Islam, men and women are overall equal. Just because a particular group of Muslims don't give their rights to the women, that does not mean Islam is wrong. Therefore, I say, that women's rights in Islam should not be judged what individual Muslims do or what the Muslim society does. The women's rights should be judged by the authentic sources, that is the Holy Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And in this lecture I have proved there that Islam gives the maximum right more than even the Western world. It gave 14 years ago about economic rights, the right for them to own property, about spiritual rights, about legal rights, about social rights, about educational rights in detail. You can refer to the video cafe. Why particular individual Community does, you go and ask them. Islam does not preach that. Regarding fundamentalists, that Muslim is a peace-loving people, why are they fundamentalists? I tell that I am proud to be a fundamentalist. Dr. Zakir Naik is proud to be a fundamentalist. What is the meaning of fundamentalist? A person who follows the fundamentals is called a fundamentalist. So if you, if you have to be a good mathematician, you should know, you should follow, and practice the fundamentals of mathematics. If you don't know the fundamentals of mathematics, unless you are a fundamentalist mathematician, you cannot be a good mathematician. To be a good doctor, you should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of medicine. Without being a fundamentalist doctor, you cannot be a good doctor. Similarly, I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. I know, I follow and practice the fundamentals of Islam. But I do know that in the modern context, fundamentalist means terrorist. Terrorist. It doesn't mean what it actually means. A Hindu, to be a good Hindu, you should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of Hinduism. You should be a fundamentalist Hindu to be a good Hindu. For a Christian to be a good Christian, you should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of Christianity. Unless he's a fundamentalist Christian, he cannot be a good Christian. But now the question is, I know that each and every fundamentals of Islam, they are good. They aren't against humanity. If the fundamental of a particular religion is against humanity, then you can say the fundamentalist, but that fundamentalist is a bad human being. There is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity. All are favoring humanity. The reason you may think it is against humanity because of lack of knowledge. Either you may not be knowing the Islamic law correctly, or you may not be knowing the statistics of the world correctly. Regarding terrorists, a person like the freedom fighters of India, you know, what we call them freedom fighters. Desh Bhakt. The British government called them terrorists. Same man. Same work he's doing. The Indians feel the Britishers had no right to rule India. Therefore, these people are freedom fighters. The British government thinks that they have a right over India. They think they're terrorists. Same man, same activities, two different labels. So depending upon which view you agree, if you agree with the British view, you'll call them 
terrorist. If you agree with the Indian view, you will call them Desh Bhakt. So a person can be given different labels by different criteria of judgment. If you judge a person correctly, no true Muslim can ever be a terrorist. A few, see there are black sheep in every community. There are black sheep in every community. That does not mean Hitler. He insinuated 6 million Jews. So can we say Christianity is that? You are a Christian. Just because Hitler insinuated 6 million Jews, Mussolini killed thousands of people, you cannot say Christianity is that. Similarly, there are black sheep in every community, but the labels differ upon what view you agree with. Hope that answers the question. Well, there is another question, sir. The question is, why is it women of Islam are not allowed to have equal rights of employment in Afghanistan? Why aren't women in Afghanistan have equal rights for employment? The thing is that in Islam, a woman is allowed to do any work as long as it doesn't go away out of the Sharia of loose. For example, a woman cannot work in an alcoholic bar. Even a man cannot work. A woman cannot work in a gambling den. Even a man cannot work. A woman cannot do jobs which exploit a body like modeling, you know, modeling, film acting. It exploits the body. We want a woman folk to be respected. Thousands of men are looking at the woman and, and whistling and all. And we believe in a modest way of life. Therefore, such jobs which exhibit the body, the Western culture, talking about women's liberation, it is actually a disguised form of exploitation of the body of the woman, of deprivation of, of honor and degradation of a soul. The Western society, claiming to uplift the woman, have actually degraded her to a status of concubines, to mistresses and society butterflies, which are hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. Art and culture! Islam doesn't agree with such job. Otherwise, the other job, if it's a modest job, if she has the hijab and the segregation of sex, she can very well do it. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. See what reports we get in the papers. We don't know whether it's right or wrong. The Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 5 and 6, whenever you get in the news, verify it. I read in the Indian papers that these Afghanistan, these Mujahideens, they kill the women, they say you should not go to work, and they stop the doctors going from work, all the lady doctors, and they stop the pay, etc. I read in Time magazine. Time magazine says that the Mujahideen has stopped the women from doing immodest jobs. Even after they have stopped, but they have not stopped lady doctors. They have not stopped lady, lady teachers. And those people who they have stopped, they are providing them the salary at the doorstep. At the doorstep. If anyone says that, Helen was Helen. I would love it. Don't work, salary at doorstep. Why? To prevent them from doing immodest things. Let's see, you are doing an immodest job, we tell you to stop it, it is wrong. It is attracting violence. Don't do modeling, don't do dancing, don't do film acting, but whatever salary you are getting, we will provide you at your doorstep. So the views that we get brother, in the papers is variant, different. I can't say sitting from here, which is right. Whether Time, Times of India is right or Time magazine is right, I don't know. So therefore, Quran says, ask the person who knows. There are experts in this field, you know. But what reports I get, I have given you the view. That this is just the media is in the hands of the Westerners. They control the media and they malign unnecessarily Islam. Hope that answers the question. My name is Burhari. I'm an advertising professional. The Quran says Allah is most merciful. It also prescribes later on the kind of very severe punishment to enjoin that people who don't follow the religion. Uh, so is he a revengeful God? Is he a vengeful God or is he a merciful God? My name is Burari. Right. Mr. Burari, what are the vengeful punishments? You must be a little more specific than you. To God's eyes, he will throw us to hell and he'll have all kinds of problems. He therefore vengeful God. Oh, but I just think the a good question. Yeah, I, I understood the question. I am in the field, I understand the question. The brother asked the question that the Quran says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman Rahim, merciful, most gracious. Then why does he give punishment? You know, revengeful or horrifying, is a horrifying God, etc. And you have punishment, as I said, capital punishment for rape. In this world, some punishment, as he said, will be put in the hellfire, etc. The thing to realize, brother, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a merciful God, at the same time, just God. Both. Just and merciful. Quran gives nine ten different attributes. 
So for example, if someone comes and rapes, so you can't say, oh, God is so merciful, God lets the rapist go free. That's not a merciful God, that's an unjust God. What about the person, the lady which was raped? If you let him go free, the statistics tell us today, a person who commits rape once, again when you go to society, 95% of the time you commit a rape again. People say, no, first give him five years imprisonment, second time death penalty. Statistics tell us today of America, that 95% of the time when a person commits rape, when you go to society, again he commits rape. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful and just at the same time. Allah is just to the lady who was raped, and Allah is even merciful to that man. He'll commit a rape again. It's bad for him committing rape. Similarly, if you rob, Quran says chopping of the hands, you call it a very ruthless law. Oh, Islam is a ruthless chopping of the hands. First, Islam says the system of zakat, as I said. You should, every rich person should give 2.5% of excess wealth to poor people. After that, if someone robs, chopping of the hands. So, in Maida chapter 5, verse 38 says, that as for the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People think that every second person who come across Saudi Arabia will have his hand chopped off. I have been to Saudi Arabia, I did not come across a single person with the hand chopped off. There will be few people, I have not come across them. It's not as common as you seem. If you implement the Sharia in America today, that every person, rich person should give zakat, charity, and after that if anyone drops, chop off the hand. Will the rate of crime in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful at the same time just. And he's very careful in taking of account. All three. So all three can only come together if a person sings the justice for the whole of humanity. Overall to humanity, is it merciful or not to stop rape? Is it merciful or not? Merciful. If you say no, let the people enjoy, so today you'll have 1,000 rape, tomorrow 10,000 daily, it will keep on increasing. So this law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to the whole humankind, not only for a particular group of people, or only for Muslims, or only for Saudi Arabia, or only for Americans. It is merciful to the whole of humanity. That's why these punishments have been kept, so that even they improve, and it's benefit to the whole of humankind. Hope that answers the question. First of all, the question that the women have a lot of responsibility to keep up to themselves, I do agree. As I mentioned, details I mentioned in my video cassette. It calls for a talk. But yet, the rights are equal. Quran does not put them at a lower level. Quran clearly states in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 238, that the women have rights equal to them, as those against them, on terms equitable. They have equal rights. What are the rights? You can refer to my video cassette. They are right, but it is equal. It is not that more burden is put on women, so men can relax. In some places, brother, the women have got more burden, men have got less burden. In some places, men have got more burden, women have got less burden. Like looking after the family, the burden is put on the shoulders of the man. It's the duty of the man to earn the living. Lodging, boarding, clothing, on all financial aspects of the woman. Before she's married, it's the duty of the father and the brother. After she's married, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after a boarding, clothing, lodging, everything. So some aspects, if you see my video cassette, I've analyzed there. In some cases, the women have a higher responsibility. In some cases, the men have a higher responsibility. Overall, both are equal. Hope that answers the question. Can you teach people in Kashmir about brotherhood of Muslims and Hindus and succeed? So that was the question that can you go and teach in the, peop the people of Kashmir, the brotherhood and succeed. I feel somebody should try this. I had gone to Kashmir when I was a kid, just for touring. I haven't gone there now. But everyone should follow in Toto. You can't follow part of the Quran and then say it, it's not successful. If anyone living in Kashmir, whether he be Hindu, Christian, Muslim, etc., if they follow Quran in Toto, there is bound to be nothing but peace. Hope that answers the question. been asked by the organizers to, 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 to
bring this session to a close. One last question from Captain C.K. Subramaniam, retired. Thank you, Captain. I would like clarification on a question of universal will, with the will of Allah and the individual will in Islam. The Islamic doctrine that the power of action proceeds from Allah, universal will, every human being is morally responsible for his own action. Individual will needs clarification. Rudra asked the question that the difference between the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and individual will, as rightly agreed, the, the Quran says that even a leaf cannot fall without a permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything happens with the will and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then where is the individual will? The individual will is there. Everyone has his own individual will. For example, if I tell you that from the power station, the main electric supply is coming from the headquarters for the power station, and you have a plug out here. The power is from the headquarters, the electric station. If a man puts a finger in the live wire, he'll get a shock. Who's to blame? Who's to blame? The man. God gave him free will. He could put his finger or not put his finger. You cannot blame the power station. Without the power, he would not have got the shock. If the electric supply would have been closed from top, he would not have got the shock. But because of that, you can't blame the electric supply. You have to blame the man that why did he touch a live wire? So the power is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without Allah's power, nothing can happen. But though the power belongs to Allah, Allah has given you a free will to choose right from wrong. He can stop you. He can stop you from committing a murder. But then he gives you a free will. Why? Because this life, as I've mentioned, mentioned for the Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 2, the life and death that you have is a test for the hereafter. Allah wants to see that this is an examination in the world. Hardly... Average life is 60 years, some people live for 20, some live for 80, some live for 90, average 50 to 60 years. So Allah says this life for the human beings is a test for the hereafter. Allah has given you free will. He has shown you right and wrong in the instruction manual of the Holy Quran. If you follow it, you pass the test. If you don't follow, you, you fail the test. Allah has given you a free will. Hope that answers the question. Muhammad Abdul Ali has been pestering me to put a question of his and I have been refusing on grounds that he is a Muslim. Now, anyway, this is a question which is of some interest to the Muslim community also. He writes here, some sections of our Muslim brethren object to my plea as to why I should discourage and ask why I should discourage the Milad procession in the city. What does Islam say about the Milad procession and Milad? Nawab Sahib has asked a question, and this information I got in Saudi Arabia. That some Nawab in, in Madras has said against Milad's procession. I said, I, I only know of one Nawab, that's Prince of Arcot. I don't know if any other Nawab, so I thought maybe it was the same person. And he has discouraged the Milad's procession. And the thing is that anything which you innovate new in the religion of Islam, which is not mentioned in the Quran and Sahih Hadith, it's called as Bida. Bida, innovation. I can't innovate something new in the way of life. Ha, huh, how to become a doctor if I have new styles, new techniques, no problem. But in following the religion of Islam, Islam, you cannot bring new innovation. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he never said that you have processions for my birthday or for my death. As you know, Jewel Rabbi Awal, people say it's the birthday, it is also the death day of the Prophet. So I ask the people, are you celebrating his birthday or are you, are you celebrating his death day? Those authentic sources say that he was born on the 9th Rabbi Awal and he died on the 12th Rabbi Awal. Whatever it is, there's no hadith, say hadith showing that you should celebrate. If you want to have a good session, okay, have a good talk. Have a good talk. Give the good teachings to other people. But celebrating and wasting money, you know, having processions and having band baja, etc., it is israf in the Holy Quran. It says in Surah Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse 25 and 26, all those who do Israf, they are brothers of the devil. We have a Muslim brother who put songs at full blast on this day, and they record big processions in trucks, and they shout out slogans, Nabi ka daman, nahi chodenge, nahi chodenge. I ask, where have you caught the daman that I want to leave it? The question of leaving only arises when you 
catch the daman. So first hold Atiullah or Atiya Rasul. Read the Quran with understanding, read the Sahih Hadith and you'll know the true spirit. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We, we apologize to Mr. Manoj of Cancer Research, Mr. C. Veerabhadran, Engineer, Mr. V. R. Lakshmi Narasimhan, Stockbroker, Mr. Muttusani, Engineer, Mr. G. S. Murari, and Mr. A. Prasad for not having the time to have their questions answered. Now, we are coming to... Well, ladies and gentlemen, could you bear with me for a couple of minutes more, please? We are coming to the close of the session. We have had an excellent evening. You would like me to go over there? Okay. We are sincerely grateful and thankful to you all for having come and made this evening a brilliant success. Now, before I conclude, I should like to once again appeal to our Muslim friends to make sure that our non-Muslim guests are able to enjoy their dinners peacefully, calmly and in tranquility. And I, on my own behalf and on behalf of all the organizers, thank you all very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.